Welcome to our sixth video on the overview to ARC 331 and 332. This is talking about our what we call the initial foray into structural design. There's a really important philosophical and pedagogical question about how to approach a subject like this with architecture students. In the case of engineers, the process involves beginning with the most basic kinds of mathematical principles and building up over time an in-depth knowledge. Architecture students tend to function and learn in a different way. They're a lot more like children trying to learn to play basketball. You would not put children in a class talking about the theory of free throw shooting when they've never touched a basketball. Architecture students struggle to understand how any subject has meaning in the context of the overall design process. So to get this started, we tend to be not terribly quantitative, but focus very strongly on qualitative issues, particularly in the context of a complete design project and a complete design process. So we call this the initial foray into structural design. It consumes the first half of ARC 331. In the course of this portion of the course, students are given numerous examples of various types of structural elements, and they're given guidelines for spans and proportions of those structural elements. And they have to put a design for their building together. So I liken this to leaping into the deep end of the pool where the students don't necessarily know much about structures when they start the process, but they're very quickly trying to understand the meaning of structures in the context of the larger design problem. The key topics for the initial foray into structural design are mainly conceptual, and they involve conceptualizing a structure as a system of parts selected and assembled in a manner to resist all vertical forces. So this would primarily uh, be gravity downward and wind suction upward, but it could also be vertical components of seismic disturbances and all horizontal forces in all directions. There is no prevailing wind direction relative to structural survival. One of the reasons for that is that hurricanes can make landfall almost anywhere, and you don't know where your building is going to be relative to the eye of the storm. So wind can be coming literally from any of the 360 degree directions. So in the design conceptualization, the building has to account for horizontal forces in every conceivable direction. That's true of wind forces and it's true of seismic forces. There have to be elements there to provide resistance to all of these forces in all these directions. The second part of this is conceptualizing a structure to address an intended architectural purpose. This purpose is chosen by the students and the students are responsible for coming up with a program for their building. Um, there are very few specific criteria, except that it has to be a structurally challenging building, which means the shortest possible dimension of span needs to be at least 50 feet. That's an arbitrary number that's chosen to make sure that the students don't design something that can be done by 2x12 uh, beams in a fairly trivial manner. It's designed, the problem is intended to challenge the students to think in terms of truck structural systems and assemblages of parts to make uh, a structurally efficient and logical system. The building also has to have daylighting in it. That's one of the criteria. Um, and the third activity or conceptual issue is applying guidelines for spans and proportions 
of common spanning members, such as beams, parallel cord trusses, triangular trusses, bow trusses, rigid frames, arches, vaults, domes, suspension structures, and cable networks. Most of the students, of course, do not do something as sophisticated as cable networks and suspension structures. They may not even do domes, vaults, or arches, because the point of this exercise is primarily to establish basic competency and to establish a dialogue between the students and the faculty that will allow the faculty to understand what the thought processes are that students have and help guide those thought processes. The initial foray involves three successive phases. Phase one involves generating concept sketches and articulating design issues and the design philosophy. This is provided to the students. It's uploaded online. The faculty look at it, provide feedback, and that allows the students to move on to the next phase, which is the generation of scale drawings in CAD, showing all the thicknesses of all the architectural elements, including thermal insulation and curbs. Those things are not uh, crucial to structural behavior but they have a huge impact on daylighting apertures. And so we ask that those drawings be done precisely and that all of those dimensions be accounted for. That everything has to be drawn in proportion and consistent with the guidelines for spans and proportions. Then phase three involves generating a physical model made of materials that are appropriate or have appropriate properties and proper proportions for all the structural elements. Now, a crucial part of these scale drawings is to do them in CAD. And along the way, assignments are given to get students thinking more precisely in terms of how to generate such a drawing. This is an example of one of the assignments or the solution to one of the assignments. A space is given in this case that had a 30 foot span. There was a need for 120 inch or 10 foot clearance below the lowest structural element. The structural element spanning from this column to the next one in the grid had to have a spanning element of sufficient depth to do that. So that depth is then established. And from there on up, Curds, curbs are established, secondary spanning members are established, uh, there's a certain decking thickness, a certain insulation thickness. This curb has to come high enough to catch the water that comes down into this low portion of the roof. And then the daylighting apertures have to be made high enough in order to get adequate aperture area. In this particular problem, they were asked to generate an aperture that's 20% of the floor area being illuminated. And in addition to all that, the spacing of the apertures has to be determined so that there's an overlap of the primary uh, area of illumination from this aperture and the primary uh, area of illumination for the light from this aperture. And then students are asked to look at some alternate solutions where this sawtooth at the south end of this building gets replaced with a flat roof. And they discover when they do that, that they don't have an overlap of the primary daylighting zone. So this is a dark zone. And that means it does not meet our primary criterion for uniformity of the daylight. Students will be shown many examples of former student work, and then they generate their own design. So for example, here is something that represents a rigid frame steel structure. And in this case, the steel structure would normally go like this, but these students chose to put a large overhang out here. And this large overhang, by the way, helps to offset the weight of this. So in some ways, the large overhang actually makes the structural system perform better. So this would be a rigid frame steel structure. 
this is intended to be a rigid frame trust steel truck structure. Uh, this is a series of glue lamb arches that come and support a corrugated steel deck. A slightly unusual combination, but nonetheless one that works very well. Here's a, an example of a bow truss system. The students are provided in advance with a rubric which they use to assess how well their system is behaving. And then that rubric is used to grade their projects. So the rubric is in, in the form of an active Excel spreadsheet. When we go to grade it, the model evaluators, which typically will be me, I will write my name here, I'll list the name of the model creators, and I'll go down and I'll look at, do they have the structure to account for dead and live or snow load on the roof? And literally I will go with a set of calipers and measure the thickness of whatever they've used to represent the decking. I'll measure how far the decking is spanning from one support point to the other. I'll take the proportions of that and I'll assess whether that decking has adequate depth according to the guidelines that we have for spans and proportions of corrugated decking. Um, we'll also look at wind suction in the roof, live and dead load on floors if there are any floors. Then we look at the lateral forces of wind or earthquake in the north-south direction on the structure, and then those same forces in the east-west direction on the structure. And everywhere along here, we have a certain number of points in the category. So, for example, for the dead and live load on a roof, we have 14 points allocated for that. And the number in this cell is the number that's going to be deducted. So if it's uh, perceived that two points deduction is appropriate, then two will be put here. Uh, for wind suction, it's six points. For live and dead on any given floors, it's 10 points. Um, for the lateral forces in the north-south direction, it's 10 points. And then 10 more points for the lateral forces in the east and west direction. Then there's a, a section on model building technique, and this gets kind of interesting because sometimes the model does not behave very well structurally. It may not be that it was poorly conceived. It may be that it was not well glued together, so parts of it that should be composite or parts of it that should be bracing each other are not pop properly connected together. So there's a 20-point value attached to the model building technique. Sometimes it's hard to separate model building technique from the actual conception of the structure because sometimes it's hard to tell what was going through the minds of the students who create the models. Um, there's a whole section on daylighting. Um, for example, are the apertures oriented to avoid summertime beam sunlight? Are they sized to admit enough light without thermally overloading the space? Are they located appropriately to distribute light effectively around the space? Are they protected with overhangs where appropriate? So there's a total of five points in each of these categories. And um, some students might do very well in one of these categories, but ignore another one. Then there's uh, some comments about function. Uh, does the building seem to form, perform the function it was intended to function, and does, does it do so well? And then there's a, a small uh, amount that's devoted to artistic or aesthetic value. We're not focusing a great deal on that because we're primarily trying to establish competency here in terms of uh, do the designers of these structures understand structures well enough? Are the parts and pieces that need to be there there? Are they in proper proportion? And does the daylighting work? The question of aesthetics, of course, is incredibly important in buildings, but that is not the primary focus of this particular exercise. So that is the evaluation rubric. After the students have submitted their models and the faculty have graded the models, 
we have a session of two hours or three hours where the students get together and they use this rubric to grade other students' models. And the purpose of that is not to establish the grade of the original model builders, but it's to give students a chance to use these critical thinking tools uh, to look at other people's projects. And that's often extremely enlightening to them. Um, numerous students have told me that they considered that one of the best parts of this exercise because they could see their own blind spots better when they saw the blind spots that other people had. So they do their evaluations of the other students' models, and then the faculty members do the evaluation of their evaluations. Sometimes the student evaluations are helpful because they point out things that the faculty missed in the original assessment but that's not the primary function of this particular exercise. That ends our sixth overview, uh, focusing on the initial foray into structural design, which as I said, lasts for the first half of ARC 331, and then we move on from that to more detailed issues having to do with structure.